back from break. So uh, let's take a look then at the next set of problems. So here they are. Uh, here's another midterm from some number of years back uh, from physics, 3A general physics. Hey, that's the same name as this course. Um, all right, so we've got uh, another kind of uh, ideal gas problem here. We have air near the surface of the Earth. Now, this is a bit of an approximation, but, but not too much. Let's just say that the atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen. That's a pretty good approximation. So we'll say 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Now, the nitrogen is diatomic. It's N2, and it has a molar mass of 28 grams per mole. The oxygen, also diatomic, and uh, that is 32 grams per mole. Now, the big, the big R here, um, th this, came from, uh, this came from another textbook where uh, they actually were using a different value of big R. They had uh, mentored it to, uh, as 8.315. They had rounded up instead of rounding down uh, on that next digit. But, uh, so not, not a big issue. Uh, that that's different, but just a realization that sometimes you'll see uh, these small variations in, in accepted values of, of some numbers. All right, so let's see. The first thing we're supposed to do is find out the density of nitrogen, and then we're going to supposed to come back and find out the density of oxygen. So what would happen if uh, the entire atmosphere were nitrogen? How dense would that nitrogen be if it were 100%? nitrogen. Well, we can take the ideal gas law. We can take the, the factor of little n and rewrite little n as the sample mass divided by the molar mass. Big M is the molar mass here. Uh, the total mass of the sample divided by the molar mass tells me how many moles I have. So what we're doing is we're taking the, P, the, the Pivnert uh, form of the equation we want to rewrite it in terms of density. Now, when I look at this formula right here between PV and M over MRT, I can see that the M and the V can be combined on one side, and then the big M would go to the numerator on the other side, RT would go to the denominator. So the density, which is M over V, could be written as pressure times the molar mass, divided by the gas constant, divided by the temperature. And, and that's, a, that's a general formula. That's an alternate version of the ideal gas law that is written in terms of the density of the gas. Uh, instead of uh, numbers of moles or whatever, it's written in terms of density. Okay, So we, we can just apply that to nitrogen and then come back and apply it to oxygen. Now it says if the, if the atmosphere were one atmosphere pressure and uh, entirely 100% nitrogen and uh, here's big R and it's at a temperature of, what was this, 20 Celsius? Yeah, so 20 Celsius is 293 Kelvins. It says the density of that nitrogen would be 1.164 kilograms per cubic meter. Now if we do the same calculation for oxygen, which is what we're doing right here, same formula, pressure is the same, uh, temperature is the same, big R is the same. The only thing different is it's a different molar mass. So uh, uh, an atmosphere made of 100% oxygen, where there's one atmosphere pressure and a temperature of 20 Celsius, that's going to be denser because the oxygen molecules are heavier. So it's kind of interesting that what you end up with at a certain pressure and temperature is kind of the same number of molecules, but uh, you end up with densities that do depend on the molar mass. So this would make for a heavier atmosphere. This would make for a denser atmosphere. Um, now what we can do in part C is combine the uh, oxygen and the nitrogen in proportions of 79%, and 21%. Since the molar masses, um, you know, the molar masses here are 0 0.028 and 0 0.032, that's what's driving these differences in density. And the pressures 
are directly, or the, um, yeah, the pressures are directly proportional to the numbers of, or the density, directly proportional to the number of molecules present. So we can actually just take 79% times this density and 21% times the density of oxygen, this is for nitrogen, and combine them, and that's how we get the 1.20 that we've been using. Okay, we can also do measurements of air and find out that that's the density at 20 Celsius. But this is kind of an uh, ideal gas formula approach to determining the density of, of air, or at least a, a nitrogen-oxygen um, atmosphere. Now, what would happen if, for example, what if the atmosphere contained 1% of argon, which it does, uh, so actually 1% of the atmosphere is argon. Well, that density of argon, argon has a molar mass of 40, and the density of a purely argon atmosphere at 293 Kelvin and 101,300 Pascals would be 1.66. So the argon's not a lot heavier, but, but it's, it's definitely heavier. And then the other major constituent, constituent of our atmosphere is water. So, uh, and we talked about water being variable. It could go as low as, as close to 0% in really dry regions, in a really dry climate, or it could go as high as 4% uh, when the humidity goes way up at high temperatures. So high temperatures and uh, lots of water available to evaporate, we could get 4% of the air molecules to be water. So, uh, now water, is not as heavy. H2O has a molar mass of 18, and so uh, an atmosphere made out of water vapor, uh, so individual molecules of water would only have a density of 0.749. So the water's a lot less dense um, compared, well, let's, let's look at the density. So water's density would be 0.749, uh, the nitrogen density is quite a bit larger, and the oxygen is larger, and then the uh, argon is quite a bit larger than any of those. And it, it all comes down to what's the molar mass of the um, molecules making up this sample of gas. All right, so uh, a little bit of a departure, but kind of an interesting departure using the ideal gas model to determine densities. Moving on to problem two, so this is, uh, it's one of those specific heat, latent heat kind of problems. It says that we're taking a sample of iron at 180 Celsius and we're transferring that into a calorimeter. So this is kind of what we did in class in a lab with a specific heat lab. Um, we took metal samples, now they weren't at 180, they were at 100 Celsius, but we took samples of the uh, of different metals, placed them into a, an aluminum calorimeter cup. Uh, now in this case, the calorimeter cup contains uh, glycerin. Uh, so that's uh, a compound, that's an organic compound, and it's liquid, so we're actually not going to be looking for the specific heat of iron, we're going to say the specific heat of iron is given. Uh, we're going to be looking for the specific heat of glycerin. How do we go and determine what the specific heat will be? So, let's see. There is this specific heat of water here. It's not going to go into our calculations anywhere, but, but we could compare that with the glycerin once we're through. So, so let's take a look and see what we've got. So, uh, I started with the iron. Here's the iron being cooled down, the final equilibrium temperature observed to be 38 Celsius. So the Q coming out of the iron is MC delta T, that's 310 grams at 0 0.450 joules per gram per Kelvin, and the temperature drop was 142 Kelvins. So that's 19,810 joules that we are taking out of the iron that's going to come out of the iron. Now it's going to transfer into the aluminum cup and it's going to transfer into the glycerin. So these are the two Qs 
that we need to write down now. So let's, let's get the aluminum cup. Starts out at 10 Celsius uh, and ends up at 38. Now it's 100 grams. Specific heat for aluminum is uh, 0.900 joules per gram per Kelvin, and that temperature increase was 28 Kelvins. So that gives us, well, that's not much, 2,520 joules. So the iron provided, see if that makes sense. Sure. So the iron provided almost 20,000 joules of heat, and, you know, 2,500 joules are going into the aluminum cup. Now, the remaining portion is going into the glycerin. So we can take uh, Q1 and subtract off Q2. We can define Q3 as the heat going into the glycerin when it goes from 10 Celsius to 38. And we know what the Q value is. So using energy conservation, we can say that the Q value for that would be uh, 17,290 joules that went into the glycerin. Now the glycerin, we're told, we, we, we uh, got a mass of that as 255 grams. And so uh, the specific heat formula is going to look like this. I'm solving for the specific heat for the glycerin. So I can take the heat, divide through by the mass, and divide through by delta T. So that's all of this heat. The remaining heat went into the glycerin. Uh, I divide that by 255 grams, and I divide that by 28 kelvins, the delta T. And it says that the uh, specific heat for this uh, glycerin is uh, 2.42 uh, joules per gram per kelvin. We should have drawn a glycerin molecule in here. Uh, what is it? Gly glycerol, glycerin? Okay. A anyway, it's got to be related to glycerols and triglycerides, right? Uh, it's got to be some three carbon thing. Uh, anyway, the glycerin, the liquid glycerin, has a specific heat of 2.42 joules per gram per kelvin. And uh, it looks like gram for gram, you know, that's about half the specific heat of water. Water still has a, a relatively high specific heat, although we have not adjusted uh, per mole. So we should really put these as molar uh, specific heats to, to do a, a more fair comparison. All right, so uh, again, it's another one of those calorimetry problems, keeping track of specific heats, latent heats, uh, borrowing a little energy from here, transferring it over to a different part of the system, and then at the end of the day, determining some property of some of the materials. Questions on any of that? Okay, so um, let me uh, move on then. So here we are in problem three. Uh, problem three, ooh, it's one of these um, thermodynamic cycle problems. So it looks like we have three steps. And uh, a couple of them look familiar, and um, one of them, not so much. So let's take a look and see what we've gotten ourselves into here. Uh, a to B looks pretty familiar. That's a constant volume process. C to A looks pretty familiar. That's a constant pressure process. But there is this straight line from B to C. Now, you might think that's an isotherm, but it's not, an isotherm would be curved. And so, uh, how are we going to deal with this process? And uh, what we can do here is, um, it says for each step, calculate W, calculate work, energy transferred through work, which means transferred through a compression or transferred through an expansion. Now, um, and then we've got to calculate heat transfers. Now, the heat transfers, I could use the specific heats that we've developed, but I tend to start out with delta E's. To me, delta E is the easiest. If I can get temperatures at every location, uh, the delta E formula is very easy. The delta E formula for, this is oxygen. Oxygen is diatomic. Uh, the diatomic formula is going to be five halves 
and R delta T. And that's it, done. So I can calculate this once I get all the temperatures determined. Now, here's a picture of that PV diagram. It's, uh, they, told us, they told us it's one mole, right? Yeah. So I don't know who counts this stuff. So somebody counted all the molecules and determined that there's one mole present. Ooh, actually, I think it's, uh, it's 32 grams. So uh, they took a 32 gram sample of oxygen, and, uh, which is one mole. Uh, it's diatomic, so the CV is 5 halves R, the CP is 7 halves. Now, we could use those, but, but I de decided not to, I guess. Uh, the temperature at point A, I can calculate as PV over NR. In fact, I can do that at every location. So, I can calculate the temperatures using the ideal gas law, and N is equal to 1 mole in each case. Now, this stuff I can read off the... the the uh, PV diagram. So it says that P naught is 100 kilopascals, V naught is 20 liters. Uh, so A and B, A would be at 100 kilopascals, B is double that, that's at 200, C is back down at 100 kilopascals. Uh, as far as the volumes, point A is at 20, B is also at 20, um, at point C we double the volume that would be 40 liters. Uh, and then finally, the uh, temperatures can be calculated using this formula. Uh, and, and I rounded these just a bit. Um, they didn't come in exactly at those numbers. And so the temperature at B and C is actually twice as high as the temperature is at uh, point A. So, so just to be clear that we've got that factor of two uh, relating the temperatures. Okay, so now that I've got my table, point A, B, C, here are the pressures, here are the volumes, here are the temperatures, I can calculate all the internal energy uh, increases and decreases, 5 halves NR delta T. For A to B, I got 5,000 joules increase. From B to C, now, now notice that's a straight line which means that at first the temperature went up a little bit and then it came back down. The isotherms would be those curved hyperbola uh, and that same isotherm goes through point B and point C. Point B and point C are at the same temperature. Uh, but all that delta E is concerned with is what's the difference uh, between points B and point C, and it turns out it's zero. So no, uh, no internal energy difference between point B and C. And then between C and A, again, I can use temperature differences, and here the internal energy goes down 5,000 joules. So that's what's happening with the internal energy at each step. So uh, again, one formula applies for all of the different processes. Now, the next one I went to was work. Uh, work can be calculated by um, looking at the area under the curve in the PV diagram. So, uh, now, going from A to B, there's no expansion, there's no compression. Uh, that says that the work there is zero. So the work for a constant volume process, that's going to be zero. Now, from B to C, is an expansion, and that means work is leaving the gas. Energy is transferring away from the gas molecules when there's an expansion. When we go from C back to A, that's a compression. Energy is being put back into the gas molecules through work uh, during a compression. Now, the energy transferred out from B to C, looking at the area under the curve, is bigger. It's more and then going from C to A, the energy that gets put back in, is just this square down here. Now, the squares, uh, P, P naught, the squares have an area of P naught times V naught, and that's 2,000 joules. So the area underneath C to A, that's the equivalent of 2,000 joules, and that triangle is half of that area, which is the equivalent of 1,000. So 
Uh, from V to C, I include the 1,000 plus the 2,000 joules. That's 3 halves P naught V naught, and that's 3,000 joules, leaving the gas molecules. Uh, from C to A, that's exactly P naught V naught. That's equal to 2,000 joules, and that's transferring back in. So let, let's, take, let's check the units here, too. So uh, 1,000 liters is 1 cubic meter. So these volumes are currently in liters. These pressures are in kilopascals. So that's a thousand times a pascal, but this is one thousandth of a cubic meter. So it says that a kilopascal times a liter is a joule. Now, I don't know if it's a good idea to work from that. If that makes sense, go ahead and use it. But probably better than that would be to take these volumes this is 0 0.020 cubic meters. Take the liters and convert into uh, cubic meters. So, and that's dividing through by a factor of a thousand. All right, so we got all of the delta E's, we got all the W's. We can calculate Q's in general. Once we have the delta E's and the W's, we can just add those together. So what happened? In the first step, from A to B, uh, it must be that no energy was transferred due to work. There was no compression, no expansion. That means 5,000 joules of heat must have come in. So from A to B, we placed the sample in a high temperature environment and let the heat flow in, and we let 5,000 joules come in of heat, and that raised the internal energy by 5,000 joules. Now, in step B to C, that's where uh, this, it's, it's a heat engine. So what's happening here is any process where we expand at high pressure and then reset at low pressure, that's a heat engine. What we're doing is we're taking a certain, certain amount of heat and converting it into work. So we started out by putting 5,000 joules of heat into the system and then we let it expand. So from B to C, we let uh, the expanding gas molecules push the environment out of the way. Maybe it operates a turbine, generates some electricity, maybe it's in our automobile, uh, but we're getting 3,000 joules of mechanical energy during that expansion process. Now, during that expansion process, we're continuing to let heat into the system. So, uh, and, and as a result, the internal energy didn't change. It ended up at point C at the very same temperature. Uh, so we let a bunch of heat come in from A to B, additional heat from B to C, um, and that's where we got this work. Now, resetting the system, going back from C to A, that's a compression. So we're pushing on those gas molecules, pushing them back into place, but at the same time, we're lowering the temperature, so we're putting it in a low temperature environment, and 241 is really low, isn't it? That's like way below freezing. Uh, anyway, that's 7,000 joules of heat coming out. So for a, a closed loop, uh, delta E net uh, is going to be equal to zero. Uh, and that's what we see here, 5,000 in, 5,000 out. The Q net was 1,000... There was a net investment of 1,000 joules of heat uh, going in at high temperature, and the work coming out was 1,000 joules. Now, it's not 100% efficient because uh, along the way, we actually put 8,000 joules in. So this is like our QH, and this is like the QL. So we put in 8,000 joules of heat. Uh, 1,000 of that became work. 7,000 went right into the environment as uh, leftover heat. All right, so that's our uh, thermodynamic cycle problem. And again, what was key on this one, we got the diagram drawn, uh, we filled in the PVT table, and then we found formulas that were more or less universal. Formulas that we could just plug numbers in pretty quickly, uh, and then take a look and see if the numbers are making sense. Okay, as always, if you're you know, on a midterm or on the final exam or whatever, 
um, and you get stuck on a problem and it, it, the numbers don't seem to make sense but you're not sure why, write a quick note and uh, let me know that you're thinking about that. Because um, if I'm grading an exam and I see numbers that don't make any sense, I think, oh my gosh, these numbers don't make any sense and uh, this student uh, wasn't even aware of it. But if you are aware, let me know that you think the numbers are crazy high or crazy low or something. Uh, and that lets me know what you're thinking. All right, let's uh, take a look at um, let's take a look at this last problem here. So uh, the last problem we have here is a heat pump, and uh, you guys know from lecture, you know, I um, am now heating my house using a heat pump, uh, and we're really happy with it, and we're running off electricity, and we're not putting any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from our natural that we used to with our natural gas furnace. So uh, the heat pump uh, transfers thermal energy from the outside, this is actually used to heat the home right now, uh, from outside uh, temperature at 6 degrees Celsius, and it's, it's, it's transferring the heat inside uh, at a temperature of 24, so the thermostat is nice and warm inside. Now here's the diagram, so the heat is being transferred from the outside, the low temperature region, into the inside, you know, it's like a refrigerator, and uh, the low temperature works out to be 279 Kelvin. Let's let's get that Celsius converted, and then the high temperature uh, inside is at 297. So those are the operating temperatures. Now we looked at these COP formulas on the other prop on the other uh, practice set of problems. This time it's a heat pump, and so QH is what we are interested in. So this coefficient of performance does become QH over W. Uh, the other one I also had is QH over W, but that was incorrect. Uh, this now can be converted into QH over QH minus QL. Once I have the COP in Qs, I can substitute in the Ts to get my ideal number. Now the ideal number here is, um, is pretty crazy. Uh, the ideal number here is uh, 297 kelvins. Am I doing this right? Yeah, that's, that looks right. And then divided through by 18. So there's a difference of 18 kelvins from inside to outside. And that's giving us a COP of 16.5. Now, uh, the heat pump that's currently heating and cooling my home uh, has a COP of 4 and it's considered one of the most efficient heat pumps on the market right now so uh, you know that's that's kind of the current state of the art is COPs of something more around 4 rather than 16 so so anyway this is a little idealized uh, but let's see what they want us to answer here so it says draw a diagram showing uh, the heat transfers we did that we got the temperature set up. Uh, what is the ideal value? So that's fine. That is an ideal value. And then part C says, okay, if the heat pump uh, operates using 1,000 watts of electricity, what would be the highest possible rate of thermal energy to the inside? And the coefficient of performance, I mean, we can calculate QH as the COP times W. So if the heat pump somehow is operating at that theoretically highest possible efficiency, uh, that would bring in 16,500 joules each second. Now, I'm only investing 1,000 joules of electricity, and we're transferring 16,000. Now, again, if it's, if it's more like the heat pump I have, that number would only be 4,000 joules, but still. Uh, that's much more efficient than um, using a heat pump versus using a heating element. If I purchased an electric space heater that just has a heating element inside and it just you, you plug it in and it glows, for a heating element, a simple you know heating element, a thousand joules of energy, electrical energy that we put in would generate 1,000 joules of heat. There's a one-to-one -one efficiency
process. Uh, if we just use the heating element to heat up the, uh, the air. Transferring it, using a refrigerant, this sounds crazy, but building a refrigerant system that actually goes to the outside, draws heat in, and then that, that hot uh, refrigerant, the, the refrigerant gets heated and brought inside, uh, and then you re just keep recycling it through. Uh, that's actually much more efficient. So uh, again, with a COP of four, that's, you're, you're getting 4,000 joules. Here, once you reach, if we were to reach ideal efficiencies, you get 16,000 joules of heat for every 1,000 joules of operating your heat pump. So, you know, on a, on, a, on a freezing winter day, when you look outside, and of course this isn't like the Bay Area, you have to go somewhere, it actually gets cold. Uh, you could look out at all the ice and all the sub-zero air and look out there and go, there is energy in those molecules out there. We can draw that energy into the house because that's what a heat pump does, okay, uh, using the coolant. So go back. If you want to see the, a detail on the heat pump, go back to lecture and take a look at that. Uh, we had some uh, good diagrams there uh, showing how they operate. Okay, I think that is it. So midterm four is coming right up. I'm guessing you guys are well prepared. Uh, I guess we have established this tradition where uh, Laney the Eagle comes out and in, in encourages everyone to study for the upcoming midterm and final exam, maybe. Uh, anyway, good luck with all of your uh, preparations. Uh, whatever questions, whatever, whatever questions you come up with, stop by office hours and we'll get those looked at.